So these memos of understanding, how, how, how big of a deal is that? I if don't. It's true. I, I don't really think it's a big deal as follows. There will be an agreement. The short term question is whether it's an immediate one or, as the president referred to it yesterday, uh, a little bit of a delay. But there will be an agreement. Uh, and I, I think that has to be baked in to a large degree, although I'm sure on any, at any given moment, the, whether it's immediate or whether it's a little bit later is an important factor. But the reason I don't think it's a very big deal is I don't think the agreement is going to turn out to have much effect simply because the Chinese uh, have such a long-term point of view and ours, uh, and I don't, I'm not referring to President Trump, I'm referring really to America's generally, is shorter term. And I think the Chinese will, will ultimately not have uh, fundamentally changed much of their uh, behavior as it relates to intellectual property and so forth. There's all kinds of complex issues on enforcement, for example. How are we really going to know this is enforceable? Answer seems to be, well, if it isn't, we'll be imposed the tariffs. I don't think that's a very effective enforcement idea. And also, um, uh, whatever amounts China agrees to buy from America is inherently short term, however big it is. So there will be an agreement. Uh, I just don't think it's going to have a big long term effect. Right. So when Citi writes, as they did today, China has bought time and has no interest of ever changing, you don't think that's far off? Not really. I don't. I don't. Uh, I, I think China is playing, an, as I said, an exceptionally long game. And I think if we were trying to make or, or, or ring out fundamental changes in Chinese behavior, we would have to play a much longer game, too. These talks would need to go on for, for a couple of years rather than a few months. And that's not really, uh, it's on one level in the U.S. DNA, and it's obviously not likely to be this particular administration's approach. Again, I'm not blaming them. And uh, therefore, I agree with essentially with the message of the city a report. So have markets uh, overreacted to the upside in terms of anticipation around this deal then? And if so, what does that mean now? Well, I personally think that markets are going to, both the fixed income side and the equity side, are going to tread water for at least the near term, if not a little longer, because there's two giant cross currents beyond the trade deal, much bigger than the trade deal, that are effectively canceling each other out. On the one hand, you have a slowdown in the U.S. We're headed toward about a 2 percent year. Uh, in terms of real GDP growth, and a more a sharper slowdown globally. China currently at, say, three to four, down from six to seven. Europe going backward fast and so forth. Uh, that's obviously putting downward pressure, theoretically, on markets. Uh, in the other direction, the Fed pause, the absence of any inflation, that pause probably continues, and the likelihood of easing are elsewhere around the world, the People's Bank of China and so forth, which is obviously at the margin positive for markets. So I see these two giant forces essentially canceling each other out, and I think markets therefore in general trade water. Obviously the equity markets are currently at a, a high over the past four or five months, but if you look back say 14 or 15 months, we're more or less around where we were at the beginning of 2018. So I, I just see this continuing for a while. Longer term, uh, and by that I mean say looking out a year, year and a half, I think there's some pretty big storm clouds, but that's a different question. Now, uh, I want to ask about the implications for big companies, because you said you don't see China making big changes, U.S. by nature, uh, a bit short term. But what about companies that tend to define themselves as global multinational companies, the, the Microsofts, the Apples, uh, that, that cast themselves as citizens of the world? What are the implications for them of how this U.S.-China trade deal is likely to work out? Well, apart from these precise negotiations, I think there is pressure on China to be less tough, for example, from a mandated joint venture point of view and mandated technology transfer point of view on those large cap multinationals, especially the tech ones, than it has been because there's been such a backlash against it, including in Europe, which is significant. Uh, so for example, Tesla is opening or has announced uh, a production facility uh, in China which will not be joint ventured and that's unusual given recent history and I think you'll see more of that so I think for reasons that aren't particularly related or, or directly related to the current trade talks I think China is backing off a bit on that I mean after all China has slowed down too. China has a big demographic problem 
in terms of aging population and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so China, ab above all, needs growth. They need growth more than anyone on Earth, given so many long-term factors that work in China and the need that the regime has to keep its populace happy. So I think for a lot of reasons, China's backed off a bit on that, and the U.S. multinationals are going to continue to do the best they can in that market because it's the largest in the world. So what does all of this mean? Uh, just looking around the world, assessing all of these, uh, you know, m macro scenarios, what does all of it mean from an actual banking standpoint, a financial sector standpoint? Well, at the moment, just thinking about what Evercore does, uh, keep in mind we're a pure advisory firm. We don't lend money. We don't buy securities for our own account. We just advise. 100% of our revenues are fees. Uh, the environment's very good. It's been good for quite a while now. Um, and by that, I mean the global transaction market of all kinds is healthy. Uh, and that's because the underpinnings, the classic underpinnings, low interest rates, robust creditability, relatively high equity market valuations, and reasonable levels of business confidence remain in place. Uh, and as long as they do remain in place, the environment for what we do will continue to be good. But right now, it's strong. It was strong in 2018. It was strong in 2017. Uh, so, of course, we hope that continues, but you just never know, uh, especially when it gets to equity valuations. If we had a sharp correction in the equity markets, and having said, I think they're going to tread water, I don't see that, that, you know, that might change that, those fundamentals. But for the moment, they're very good. Got to have you back talk more about storm clouds in yeah. the uh, days to come. Well, the 2020 election is going to be epic. I, I mean, really epic by historical standards. And I think it's going to be pretty chaotic. And I think eventually markets are going to find that a little hard to cope with.